Hi everyone and welcome back to the Retro Shack and to what I hope you'll find is a very interesting episode especially following the death of my ZX81. It's my own fault, I killed the mainboard and with no readily available mainboard drop-in replacement I thought what am I to do? Well this project by Alejandro Valero Sebastian and again I apologise if I've ruined your name um, it caught my eye a couple of years ago and I thought this would be an ideal opportunity to have a go. It's a clone of a ZX80 and ZX81, selectable via a switch. Um, I'm going to be focusing mainly on the ZX81 aspect as I have a whole episode on ZX80s later on down the line. And uh, I don't own a ZX80, or didn't until now. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the episode and let's crack on. Alejandro was kind enough to put a kit together to save me a bit of time, so let's take a look at what Mr Postman has delivered. And right out of the gate, I'm a little concerned, as all of the components have been put together into one bag, so I'm hoping that the package hasn't been thrown around too much during transit, and that all of these bits are undamaged. All of the ICs have been delivered safely pushed into some foam board, and in the correct placing and orientation that should make populating the board a doddle when the time comes. The mainboard itself is a thing of beauty, and the silk screen really seems clear with all the components clearly marked. I'm hoping this makes up for a total lack of instructions. On Alejandro's blog, there are schematics and some light instructions, so I'm hopeful that we don't come across too many issues in the build. And it's nice to see Alejandro has called out Grant Searle and all of the other people that have helped him along the way. And before we do anything, I think I'd better tidy this mat up. It looks a right state. Now, as all of the components were loose in the bag, the first thing on the agenda is to check and make sure we've got all the parts we need. Starting with the resistors, and I can't recognise resistor values from the colour codes by sight, so I have to check each one, popping it under the microscope, and it's not too clear on camera, but in real life I could see the colour bands really easily, and then we just look up the colour bands on the interweb to find out the value of the resistor. Now, of course, I'm not going to just assume that's correct because assumptions make, well, you all know what assumptions make, so I'll check the resistance using a multimeter. To do this, we first need to check the natural resistance of the multimeter wires, and then ensuring we're only touching one end of the resistor so we don't introduce resistance from our body, we measure across the resistor and add back on the wire resistance to get an indication of the true value. And if it matches the color code, we're good. And here we can see the quality of the silk screen means there really is no doubt what goes where. Very nice. It's always a good idea to offer up the part to the board to get an idea of where to bend legs etc. So you get a nice fitment of the part. And then gently bend the legs to get roughly the right width. It doesn't matter if you're a millimetre or so out at this point. When the part is pushed into place, splay the legs at the rear to keep the part fixed while you solder it in. When I'm doing a lot of soldering like this, I like to use one of these PCB holders which keep the board nice and secure and also allow you to flip the board over so you can see and work on both sides. We're going to populate a good few resistors in this manner before we do any soldering as it reduces the amount of time the soldering iron has to be kept on, and that's good for the planet, and also allows us to get into a rhythm with the soldering by not having to pause between each part. Where we can, we'll fit all of the parts of a certain value together at the same time, and then move on to another value. This way we don't have to keep checking the parts each time, just the first of the bunch, and then plough through them. And before you know it, the board looks a little less bare. And you may think I'm mad here, but I like to do a quick spot check on the installed parts to ensure everything is in the right place before I solder. It takes literally a minute and can save you ages against getting it wrong here, having to desolder and then resolder, or worse, having to order more parts in. So I should point out that as mentioned earlier in the spoiler, some parts were missing, starting with these 47k ohm resistors, which I've had to rush order in. In the meantime, I'll get on with the other parts. All of the ceramic capacitors are marked with a number, and I've popped a link in the description to a neat little tool that will convert that number into a capacitance value. And here's where the other little hiccup was in the parts list. There were supposed to be two BC548 transistors, but only one was supplied. 
Luckily, I had one of those anyway, so no big deal on that front. But it does show the importance of doing a check that all the parts are there before you begin, especially if you've set aside time to do the project and don't want to be hit with disappointment halfway through. So we'll just finish soldering up all those capacitors before moving on to the diodes. Now, a diode is essentially a one-way switch for current. It allows the current to flow in one direction, but severely limits or ideally eliminates the current flowing the other way. A diode consists of a cathode at the negative and an anode at the positive ends, and it's very important to fit them the right way round, as they're often used to protect components from unwanted current. In the case of this ZX81 clone, the diodes are used in two distinct areas. There are little ones down by the keyboard, which are designed to restrict current when more than one key is pressed at a time, and the other seems to form part of a polarity switch for the power supply, meaning this should work on centre positive PSUs like the original ZX81 and centre negative PSUs like the original Spectrum. A nice touch. If you're a purist, you should look away now, as it's time for a test fit of the 3D printed case, and I've gone for a silver case to complement the Spectrum I built last year. There's a link in the description to the Thingiverse page if you need to print one for yourself. I want to mark out where the mainboard fixing screws need to be placed, and to ensure that the board will actually fit in the first place. You know what, I reckon that looks nice, so I'll fit those bolts and carry on with the IC sockets, and then I'm waiting for those resistors to arrive. And I didn't have to wait long as they arrived whilst I was fitting the IC sockets, so that was a pleasant surprise and put me pretty much back on track. I'd already checked the 7805 voltage regulator was taking in 9 volts and outputting 5 volts to the rest of the board before I socketed any of the chips just in case. But now, with the board complete, let's power on and just check that the chips are receiving power. I'm curious because the power light isn't on, but it could just be a dud. 9 volt in and 5 volt across the chips is what we're looking for. Looks good to me. Right, let's give it a test. Exciting! So I grabbed the nearest CRT monitor I could find and plugged it all in. Now, at the moment the switch isn't connected so I'm using this jumper. Uh, let's just switch it on. And we wait, and yes, I've got a cursor, fantastic. Now the long wait for that cursor to arrive is a good indication that the 32K of memory is in place, as the 1K one just comes on straight away. Uh, you know what I've got to do here. It's a, obviously an adequate test of the 32K RAM potential of this machine by printing RetroShack rules. Now, providing of course it does pass this exceptional challenge, uh, we'll try something a little more interesting on the machine. So I'm thinking 3D Monster Maze, which is a good test that everything works and that the memory, at least 16k of it, is in place. Yes, RetroShack rules. Well, that works. So I've grabbed an LCD monitor for this test so it doesn't flicker so much, but on this screen it does appear a little darker on video, sorry about that. But I'm sure it won't detract from the immense fun of 3D Monster Maze, should this work. I'm using the ZXUE tape instead of a cassette recorder, because I can, and it's plugged into the ear socket of the machine. Load, quote, quote, and enter, and then press play on the ZXUE tape, and lo and behold, it only looks like it might be working. The screen has gone off because, if you remember, the ZX81 has a fast mode and a slow mode. Slow mode means that the screen gets updated every frame, and fast mode dedicates the CPU cycles used for drawing the display to other, more important matters, like loading software. It does leave you a little in the dark, but let's wait and see. A few moments later. And look at that, 3D Monster Maze. Proof that at least 16 of the 32K memory is accessible. The intro to this game takes ages, so we'll fast forward through that and then see if we can avoid the T-Rex. The screen goes blank again while the game crunches away, figuring out the maze and setting up the game. And we're off! Now, the aim of the game is to find the exit without getting eaten by the T-Rex. You get little um, messages at the bottom of the screen that tell you what the T-Rex is doing. It's hunting for me. And I can move using the 5, 6, 7 and 8 or cursor keys on the keyboard. Uh, it's a little slow, but hey, it's a ZX81 and it's 3D-ish. Oh, footsteps approaching. That's not good. Um, Rex has seen me. 
footsteps approaching i'm trying to run away uh, it's not very intuitive um oh did we put up with this stuff in the day oh it looks like i'm going oh he's behind me i can't navigate away quick enough and i get yep that's the end of the game it does seem a bit of an anti-climax i remember it being much more fun anyway that's not the point the point is the zx81 clone is complete and working there are probably a few things I will do to this before I call it properly finished. I may want to have a nice logo on the front, a built-in tape Ueno device with an OLED screen, clearly need to fit that on-off switch, and also I might pop a couple of LEDs on the front to indicate power status and what mode it's running in. But I hope you agree, even as it stands now, it's a lovely machine and should give me many hours of fun in the future. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the video. As always, if you like the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell for notifications of new content. If you'd like to support the channel, hit the join button for details. And finally, please leave your comments as we always love to read them. So until next time in the shack, goodbye.